started. Uh, any uh, any questions? So uh, I have some opportunities for uh, summer research positions in my lab that um, of different kinds, and I typically offer students in this class opportunities to apply for these positions. We're going to be sending some people to Honduras as part of a global health project. Last summer we sent six or eight Yalies there. We're mapping social networks in Honduras. You need to be able to speak Spanish, not fluently, but well enough. And, uh, and you need to be able to tolerate really difficult global health type conditions. You know, there's no hot showers. There's, if you have your wits about you, it's not the safest place in the world. Uh, but uh, we have a large team of people there that's working in my lab. We're mapping the networks of 160 villages, and we're trying to change uh, maternal and child health behaviors for the better. So we have a number of possible openings for students interested in that, and you need to, that's first. Second, we are developing two kinds of software in my laboratory. Uh, one is uh, a software that allows us to um, conduct experiments online. Uh, it's written in Python, I think. Uh, and um, there's opportunities for people who are interested in helping us to develop and extend that software. We also have another type of software that's uh, written in JavaScript, I believe, which um, is used to map social networks. We call it Trellis. And there's also opportunity to get involved to help us with that. So one type of software allows us to create a virtual <coughs> laboratory where we recruit real human beings to come and participate in experiments. A different, totally different software software we're using in Honduras to map social networks of people face to face. So we have those kinds of coding opportunities. So the first thing is in Honduras, data collection, on the ground, survey administration, operations, field operations uh, in Honduras. Second is in New Haven, or I suppose you could be elsewhere potentially, uh, coding on two different software things. And the third is Sounds like it's related to coding, but it doesn't require any coding. It's uh, helping us, and we'll have one or two positions this summer for this. We want to build websites uh, that uh, release our software to the world as open source. And so your task would be to build a website, uh, would be to help us write the training materials, and if you have videography skills, to interview some of the users of the software or the writers of the software to make short little educational videos. So it would be building the website, very simple format, could use WordPress or something like that, which would then have, and writing, using your prose to write manuals to describe how to use the software. So you need to learn how to be a user, which you could learn, and then you need to help write, interview the people who've written and used the code, write user-friendly ma user manuals, and then help us release this to the outside world. So those are three kinds of opportunities in the lab this summer. We also have some opportunities for people interested in mathematical modeling. Uh, we, if you have really good uh, sort of com computer science, statistics, math skills, you could uh, contact us about potentially some opportunities in that regard. So four different kinds of things uh, that are happening in the lab. If you're interested in any of them and have understood what I've described, send me an email with your CV and, uh, and also um, a kind of express interest in one of those four things. And then what I'll probably do is pass you on to my lab director and we'll go through some process of vetting uh, candidates. Any questions about that? We're doing lots of cool things in the lab. We just acquired our first robot, a little robot that uh, uh, you can navigate uh, remotely and move around the lab, which is basically a toy, but I like it. <laughs> Any questions about that? All right, and you'll see the results of some of the work we're doing. Actually, uh, the next sessions after the break, I'll be talking about social networks, featuring a lot of my own research, and you'll get a sense of how some of the work, you actually you'll get a sense in all of those things I just mentioned, the role you could potentially play uh, in those opportunities. All right, so, uh, so last time we discussed a bunch of things. We talked about some experiments with humans and with primates, some natural experiments and some deliberate experiments that manipulated relative status and explored some outcomes related to mental health, physical health, and gene expression. We continued our consideration of absolute versus relative deprivation, uh, and we discussed some of the ways that people use to cope with stress, in particular social support. And today I'd like to turn to another m sort of macro-social structure uh, that affects individual experience. And specifically today we're going to be talking about the neighborhoods. Because it turns out that the neighborhood where you live affects your health. And this would seem to be an obvious contention, but the pathways and the processes by which geographic effects come to have their impact on human uh, uh, well-being and on an individual's life chances can actually be uh, multifarious and can be quite difficult to tease out. 
So we're going to have an kind of introduction today on different kinds of ways that where you live affects your health, continuing our emphasis in the class on macrostructural features that influence uh, individuals. Okay, so, so here is the map, so here are the neighborhoods at Yale, the colleges at Yale, uh, and, uh, and which colleges have which reputations? So for example, which, which college has a reputation for uh, smugness? J.E. J.E. <laughs> <laughs> Every year that's what I hear about J.E. Okay, now what, why might that be? Why might J.E. have a reputation for smugness? Any thoughts on this? Largest endowment, okay? So people think if you're randomly born into JE, born to the manor, if you're assigned, because by and large, Yale undergraduates are now assigned randomly to the colleges. This was different, by the way, than it used to be years and years ago, either at Yale or at Harvard. Um, you're assigned randomly. And, um, uh, uh, but nevertheless, you feel that people who get assigned to JE somehow acquire this smugness property. Uh, and you believe the person who just spoke, who, who just spoke about the endowment? Yeah, what's your name? Uh, Alexander. Alexander. So Alexander thinks that it, the reason is that JE has a big endowment, and that's what makes you smug when you get there. Okay? Rich neighborhood. Other ideas about JE? Any, anything else? So the question is, is it the students at JE that makes them smug? Yeah? A lot of legacy students. Why is that? Do people know? Because Jay is really nice, and, uh, and if your parents or siblings or whatever went to JE and you're allowed, as all of you were, to pick to either be in JE or not be in JE, then, uh, then typically people say opt in to JE. But that's actually a tiny fraction of the students there, actually, truth be told. So I don't think it's that small fraction that's making the JE smug. Um, is it something about the neighborhood around JE? Maybe the physical plant. Maybe maybe the rocks in JE are are emitting sort of you know waves that just make you feel really you know proud of yourself and really smug. Yeah, Alexander, which college are you in? Okay. You win I am. Okay, so it's earned reputation. So, uh, so Alexander's position is that it's not a chance. Her position is that they have a, 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 a earned this uh, reputation. Okay. Um, okay, now which, which, uh, which college, uh, sorry, what's Pearson's reputation? <laughs> what? Raise your hand so I can hear you. Yeah? What, what's Pearson's reputation with respect to uh, GPA at Pearson? How's that doing at Pearson? No rep. Okay, so independent. So GPA does not have anything to do here. What about TD? What's TD's reputation? <laughs> Raise your hand so I can hear you. Yeah? Close-knit. Close-knit, yeah. Other side of the world, yeah? Close-knit, what else? What other kind of rep does TD have? Insular. Insular, okay. Why might TD have this rep of being close-knit slash insular? The kids there are more close-knit, they're more insular reasons? Yeah? Um, so it's freshman, we in, in the college. And you're in TD? Yeah. What's your name? Austin. Austin, right. So Austin says, look, we're randomly assigned to TD. Unlike the J Viceroys over there, we're stuck over here, and we have to, we're freshmen too, we're one of the two colleges, soon to be four, where the freshmen live in the college, and we have our, um, you know, we have to, we're a close-knit group, we have to fend for ourselves, so it's something about our geographic location that may, gives us this close-knit kind of insular property, yeah. Also, we win items out of both together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We also have the most teams of any college. There you go. So they have, they have, a, they also believe that they have a justified reputation. Um, so, um, what about what? Uh, which is the most attractive college? Ram Ram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of disagreement uh, uh, about that, and uh, I, you know, I think I think this is the most attractive college. Yes, definitely, I would say that that is, uh, is the most attractive college uh, and has the most appealing students in every possible way, uh, Silliman. So, um, so the question is, how, how might some of these features, to the extent that they are true, and I'm not validating any of your claims, but let's say they are true, how might these patterns persist despite the fact that students are randomized? 
So what, what would the fact that students are randomly assigned to these colleges, these neighborhoods, but nevertheless uh, seem to acquire these traits of insularity or smugness or whatever, uh, uh, what would that mean? What does that mean? If you do this natural experiment where you take Yaleys who are admitted, you assign them to these colleges, and, um, and then they acquire these features, what would that tell you? This is not rocket science. Yeah, what's your name? Liz. Liz? Okay, so one idea is there's intergenerational transmission, so that you arrive there as a freshman, and then they tell you, here's a secret handshake for TV, and this is how we get into the gate here, and you know, whatever. Okay, <laughs> what else? More generally, what, is, what does it tell you about neighborhoods? Any thoughts? Yeah, Gianna? Yeah, that the neighborhoods are affecting you as a human being. You're randomly assigned. You weren't smug before you got to GE. Now you are. It's something about GE that makes you that way. You weren't close-knit before you got to TV, but now you are. It's something about TV, something about the neighborhood that makes you that way. It's not as if the people who are likely to be insular uh, voted with their feet and flocked to TV, okay? So the argument is the neighborhood itself that has some effect. And in fact, that's exactly the kind of issue that not only is, is sort of intellectually important to highlight today, but also creates all the methodologic problems uh, that we are going to face when we think about neighborhood effects. So there are two kinds of ways that you can think about neighborhood effects. They're called compositional and contextual effects of neighborhoods. And effects is a little bit kind of confusing here, or like it's slightly a misnomer. Because you can say that neighborhood context matters. This is a true effect. This is the difference that places make to people. The, fa the way in which TD modifies you, or cylinder makes you so wholesome, it's the way, it's the effect of the, of the, uh, of the uh, college upon your, uh, you, yourself, you. And the second idea is not really an effect, it's neighborhood composition matters. Here's the difference that people make to places, right? So it's the way that human beings going to a particular location or being in a location might affect it. So suppose for the sake of argument that neighborhood A has twice the mortality rate of neighborhood B. Well, what if everyone in neighborhood A was old? Maybe neighborhood A is just an older neighborhood. It's not a shocking result to discover that there, there's more, there, this neighborhood is a really deadly neighborhood. It's deadly simply because of who the people are that are residing in that neighborhood, namely uh, older people. Or maybe there could be something really bad about neighborhood A. For example, for example it could be, there could be a toxic waste dump nearby, and that's what's causing uh, the problem. So today we're going to be examining the evidence that context really does matter, even after taking into account composition, and we're going to consider some possible mechanisms by which context, the neighborhood, might come to affect your health. So where you live might affect your life chances above and beyond who you are and what you brought, you know, your age or your disability or whatever else is uh, inherent in you, you brought to the situation. And the concern, for, uh, the concern for geographic structuring of health and social factors is actually an old one. I was in London this past summer, and I went to the London, the Museum of the City of London, and uh, I was blown away. Excuse me. I uh, chanced upon this, this uh, map, which I had never known about before, but which is actually quite famous. It's Booth's poverty map of London that he made not long after uh, Snow uh, was doing his mapping of cholera that we discussed uh, uh, a few while ago, a, little, a few lectures ago, John Snow, uh, and, uh, and it's quite famous in this regard, and very beautiful map. So he maps all of London. This is before, you know, uh, computer-assisted design and Adobe and stuff like that, uh, or GIS systems. He's mapping all these things basically using old-fashioned draftsman's uh, techniques. And then he colors the neighborhoods according to, you know, these are upper middle and upper class and wealthy neighborhoods, and these are lowest class, and those, look what he writes here, he writes, Vicious and vicious and semi-criminal, very poor. I can't read what that says. And then chronic, a want, a poor, 16 shillings to 21 shillings a week uh, for a moderate family, mixed and so forth, middle class, well to do, upper middle, and so forth. And then he maps the whole city of London using these colors. It creates this incredibly intricate and beautiful map here, which uh, Sam Southgate from the region has helpfully overlaid uh, the names of some of these uh, communities still. And actually, these communities have an enduring reality now a century later. The communities that were poor back then, they, some are gentrified, some are changed, and so forth. But there are features of those communities which, um, which uh, still endure. So there are two intellectual points of this little illustration. First, 
that geography, there are attributes of places that you can describe, here trivially the wealth of the place that varies from place to place, and second, that these attributes, like the suicide example we introduced the class with, might have an enduring reality uh, across time. Well, how could neighborhoods matter? Let's take a closer look at some of the uh, attributes of place that might affect uh, health. And there are three kinds of ways the neighborhood in which you live might affect your health. There's the physical environment. Very simple things like air pollution, or noise, or the housing stock, or traffic patterns. You know, you live near a busy street, you're going to be more likely to get run over by a car. All right? Very straightforward. There's the service environment, so things like grocery stores and fast food outlets, health clinics, the supply of doctors in the area, whether they're pharmacies nearby. And then there's the social environment, the people around you, and this might be measured or thought of as, as in terms of social disorder, local norms. You know, are you in a community that's a trusting community or a non-trusting community? Are you in a community where it's okay to be violent to each other or not okay to be violent to each other? You know, what are the people around you? What are their norms about uh, things? Is this a community where women can walk safely in the street without being assaulted? Or is this a community in which, no, that's just not an acceptable thing to do? What's happening in the community around us? What are, what are acceptable uh, norms in this regard? So I don't know if you saw that horrible that, uh, case, which is breaking my heart right now, of the woman who was uh, raped and killed in India, and, and the documentaries in the news right now, the British documentary filmmaker interviewed one of her assailants, who basically is a sociopath, who basically said she deserved to die because she was in the bus. Uh, at nine o'clock, right? So uh, that's like a dangerous norm to have in your community, uh, that kind of a norm. Uh, or you can imagine the social environment, the kind of social capital, which is a really important idea and which we'll really drill down to uh, in two or three uh, lectures. Something about the local environment. So let's take a quick look at some of the evidence for the effects of place before we focus on three key examples, two with respect to health. So we're gonna quickly look at e examples of each of these three things and then I'm gonna spend the remaining part of the lecture drilling down on two or three really important experiments that have been done uh, with respect to geography, which are gonna be the Chicago heat wave and the moving to opportunity example, which are relevant to health, and another example which is relevant to other outcomes. Here's a well done study looking at small area effects on cardiovascular events. This was the so-called ERIC study, the atherosclerosis risk in community study. The investigators impaneled uh, people in four different communities, Washington, Minneapolis, Forsyth, and Jackson. They had 13,000 residents who were followed for nearly 10 years, and they had 615 incident coronary events. You can see how hard this work is if you've got to follow 13,000 people just to get 600 outcome events over 10 years in order to do a study like this. And they looked at neighborhood disadvantage of the block group. A block group is a very small unit, a census unit of a few blocks that characterize the neighborhood where you live, right? So styles will have a different block group than Silliman. Uh, there are different features in that block group than there are in Silliman's block group. And you can define, you can go there and measure, you can say, well, styles is really lucky because it has a Popeye's fried chicken in its block group, <laughs> which is true. Did you know this? Raise your hands if you knew this. Yeah, I knew this. this I, one of the first things I ascertained about New Haven. And, uh, and, the <laughs> second, uh, and Silliman, alas, does not. Uh, but Silliman has other things. So you can define the block group around uh, uh, around the, where an individual lives, uh, and they looked at there were 595 block groups. So the 13,000 people lived in about 600 different block groups. And then they adjusted for individual income, education, and occupation. So they said above and beyond your own health status at baseline and your own income and education and occupation at baseline, how does something about the neighborhood in which you live, here defined as the block group, affect your risk of having an a, a, a atherosclerosis uh, in the future? And here's, uh, and here's what they found. So this looks at neighborhood disadvantage and coronary heart disease. We now have going to form groups of, of different personal incomes. So here the very poor. And then we're going to characterize the neighborhood disadvantage. So all of these people are poor, but some of them live in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods, some live in middle disadvantaged neighborhoods, and some live in the least disadvantaged neighborhoods. So above and beyond how poor you are yourself, the incidence is highest in terms of measured in terms of person years of cardiovascular uh, events among the poor people who also live in poor neighborhoods, right? So the claim is that there's something about the poverty of the neighborhood above and beyond your own poverty that has these effects. And as you can see, there's the same kind of thing that happens with uh, middle income here. When you get to higher income, maybe it begins to flatten out a little bit with the idea that we introduced earlier in the class that maybe if you're richer, rich here, let's say, uh, it doesn't matter so much what neighborhood you're in, 
Mm-hmm. You can maybe insulate yourself from the neighboring environment, or maybe not. Maybe there's still some effect here, a weaker effect, some step down uh, uh, from the most disadvantaged neighborhoods to the least uh, disadvantaged. And please note here that we're no longer looking at income inequality in the local area. This data are totally different than the data that I presented a few slides ago. Here we're not looking at the inequality of the distribution of income, which you've seen similar slides like this in earlier lectures. Here we're looking at the average wealth, or something like that, of the neighborhood in which you reside. How rich or poor it is, it, is it, not how unequally is the income within it uh, distributed. This is the actual average income in the local area at a small local area, just a few blocks around where you uh, live. And here's another aspect of the physical environment. This is the number of streets you have to cross when going to school, which can logically affect whether you are injured in the course of your life. Uh, and the layout of streets and the location of schools over which you may have very little control places you at risk. So this slide says, uh, how often you have to cross the street in order uh, to go to school. Well, raise your hand. Think back when you were in fourth grade. Raise your hands when, if when you were in sixth grade you walked to school on your own. Okay. So now I can sit here and I can think, okay, I was there in sixth grade and I had to walk to school. One, two, three. I can count the streets I had to cross. You can do that exercise for yourselves. And that's what they did here. The number of, uh, average number of streets crossed. Uh, and then they looked at the injury rate per thousand in this population and they found this type of a relationship. Unsurprisingly, the more streets you have to cross, the more likely you are uh, to suffer some kind of an injury. So this is the physical layout of place uh, might have some effect. The rest of you, how did you get to school? By bus? Yeah, it's not as common anymore to walk to school. All right. Here's another example. Where you live affects what kind of recreational facilities uh, you can have nearby. So this is recreational facilities in two neighborhoods of Glasgow in Scotland. Here's the rich neighborhood and the poor neighborhood. Now let's look at the different kinds of facilities available. <coughs> Athletic tracks, boating ponds. This is Scotland. Why the hell boating ponds is a kind of unusual feature. Uh, my favorite, though, is uh, golf courses. Uh, here, uh, the, uh, the poor neighborhood uh, has two golf courses compared to the rich neighborhood uh, in Scotland. Anyway, uh, bowling greens, these are very, again, esoteric. Kind of, Sam might know what these things are. Uh, cycle tracks, playing fields, putting greens, golf courses, tennis courts, swimming pools. There are more than twice as many such amenities in the rich neighborhood uh, than in the poor neighborhood, uh, which is not rocket science, but you can imagine now that those features might affect the ability of individuals to maintain their health above and beyond anything uh, that pertains to themselves. Yeah, question? I'm sorry, first of all, what's your name? Dustin. Dustin. Can you speak up a little? Yes, the, 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 the neighbor, that's a very good question, actually. So, when we're trying to characterize neighborhoods, and we'll come to that in just a bit, let's say I want to decide whether a neighborhood is a rich neighborhood or not. One thing I could do is I could go and I could measure every, the wealth of every respondent and average the wealth and say, this is how rich the neighborhood is. Or I could try to describe the neighborhood in a way that doesn't require me to talk to the respondents. For example, I could look at the housing stock. You know, do they have, do they have nice roofs on the houses here? So there are different ways that you can describe the neighborhood as rich or not. So here it's to, they're divided by the wealth of the inhabitants, and then they go look at the amenities. Am I answering your question? Yeah. I think I know where you're headed. You're like, well, is it a rocket science that the rich neighborhoods have these more amenities, and maybe they're paying for them and so forth? Yeah. yeah. So, but, but the point is, is they're paying for them even for the people who aren't rich in the neighborhoods. And so those people benefit as well. A poor person in a rich neighborhood is the claim will have access to more amenities, net of their own individual wealth, and therefore fare better. So something about the neighborhood you live above and beyond your own wealth will affect, will affect you. Other questions? Um, here's another example. This is, uh, this is where you live is, uh, affects whether you're exposed to bed bugs or not. I like this example a lot because, actually, this is a wiki. You can go to bedbugregistry.com. Uh, and if you encounter bed bugs at places in New York, if you're visiting your friends, for example, and their houses have bed bugs, or you're staying in a hotel, you can upload, yep, I saw bed bugs here. And then now you can kind of sort of map the city according to whether or not there are bed bugs. And your exposure to bed bugs will depend in part on where you uh, reside. And this is a free public database of user submitted bed bug reports from across the United States and Canada. It was founded in 2006 and it has tens of thousands of reports covering 12,000 uh, locations. Incidentally, I often wonder why things like that aren't done on college campuses 
for, uh, for risky environments, for example. Why it wouldn't be hard in principle to create wikis and tag locations with different kinds of things that might happen in those locations, and a kind of you know, public display of information uh, that could be potentially quite useful. Here's an aspect of the service environment. Uh, this, this is associated with the number of fast food, uh, food joints. I think this is data from Australia. This looks at population per outlet. So lower population per outlet means more outlets, right? Poor neighborhoods will have more McDonald's than rich neighborhoods. So they'll have a lower population per outlet. This is the weekly income in the district. And again, you're going to have more fast food joints per capita in the poor neighborhoods than in the richer neighborhoods. So you get fewer fast food joints in the rich neighborhoods. So the poor people are exposed to worse quality food is the argument. Yeah. Although, well, yeah, go on. What's your name? Leah. Leah. Yeah, it could also be density, so it's easier to achieve a higher, if, if you have highly dense settlements, then you can have more people near the McDonald's uh, in the district. So there are other ways of measuring it, you're exactly right. But this looks at the per capita uh, way, and it conflates the density, but it's all right. It's just illustrating the point that, for example, another way you could do it if you wanted is take each one of you, compute your wealth, and compute your distance to the nearest fast food joint, and the argument would be the richer people would be farther uh, from the, and maybe it's because they live in more, you know, uh, airy environments, you know, they're less dense or whatever the reason, you have less exposure would be the argument. Here's another, uh, here's a medical service, also uh, like bed, bug, bed bugs from New York City, uh, where you live affects what kind of medication you can get. So this looks at opioid pain relief. So this is whether or not, and I used to be a hospice doctor taking care of people who were dying, and if you're poor, if you're African-American and poor, dying in the south side of Chicago, which was the kind of patient I had when I was there, if I wrote you a prescription to get morphine, you had a hard time filling that prescription. But if you were a richer University of Chicago professor who I was caring for in the south side of Chicago, then I wrote you a prescription, you had an easier time getting your prescription filled. So this is looking at that. It's looking at opioid pain relief supplies in pharmacies in New York neighborhoods. So it looks at the race and ethnic composition of the pharmacy, and it looks at the percent black. So these are the whiter neighborhoods, these are the blacker neighborhoods. It looks at the total number of pharmacies, uh, and then it looks at the number of outlets with the percent of the pharmacies that have opioids. So first of all, the whiter neighborhoods have more pharmacies than the blacker neighborhoods. But more importantly, is that in the whiter neighborhoods, if you go and you try to fill a prescription for opioids, because you're dying and you're in agony and you need a prescription or your family goes to fill it for you, 61% of those pharmacies will be able to fill it for you compared to 30% of the pharmacies here. So this is a structural barrier to getting good pain relief at the end of life that has to do with where you live, a feature of the service environment. You see? Totally different than some of the other kinds of things that we've been discussing. And so there are fewer pharmacies and less easy access to pain relief in patients with advanced cancer according to the neighborhoods in which uh, they live. And actually, place matters quite a lot in healthcare. All kinds of things show what is known as small area variation. You're going to see this term in the future when you read the newspapers and stuff, for example, small area variation. And the American experience of death varies remarkably from one community to another. Whether a person is hospitalized, whether a person is admitted to an intensive care unit or visited a doctor and so on, all vary according to where you live. This slide shows some very famous data taken from the Dartmouth Healthcare Atlas, the so-called Dartmouth Atlas, that divides the United States into 306 so-called hospital referral regions, sort of contiguous areas where people are getting their health care from a kind of coherent set of providers. And it looks at all kinds of things, uh, but in today, uh, just for this slide, I'm going to focus on end-of-life care. Uh, and so what this slide shows is the ratio of rates of medical specialist visits during the last six months of life uh, to the United States. So that's how commonly uh, ratio of rates of medical. This side, where you live affects whether you use a specialist at the end of life. So this is the fraction of your visits that are to specialists near the end of life. So different regions in the country have different fractions of their care related to uh, uh, access to specialists uh, near the end of life. And in fact, all kinds of other things, not just whether you use a specialist or not near the end of life, vary from place to place. The chance that a decedent was an inpatient in an acute care hospital at the time of death varied by a factor of nearly three, from about 20% to 50%. So whether you die in a hospital or not, 
depends in part on what kind of hospitals are near you. Something over which you might have known in, in the lecture in which I would have given on death, we discussed this topic. Uh, we would have talked about how whether you die at home or not depends not just on whether you wish to die at home, but whether or not there are hospitals or other infrastructure around you. Often when there are more hospital beds, you're less able to die at home. Because the hospital beds sort of suck you in. You can't get out and, do, uh, and you get uh, in the hospital. Or your chance of being admitted to an intensive care unit at the time of your death also varies by a huge amount. Some regions of the country, 6% of people when they die are in an ICU. And other regions of the country, 30% of the people when they die are in an ICU. This is not because the people are so different in one part of the country to another. This is something about the service environment in that area that reshapes individual experience, modifying the kind of care you get near the end of life. And where you live also affects whether you have sensible vaccinated neighbors. Another topic that's much in the news these days because of the high prevalence of anti-vaxxers in many parts of the, uh, of, the, of the West of the United States. Which is a really weird thing because these are educated rich people by and large that are choosing not to vaccinate their kids. And in some parts of uh, LA, the rates of uh, non-vaccination are approaching the developing world. We've got like developing world conditions in the richest world, country in the world, not even among the poor people. In, these, in our country, it's among rich people in our country that are uh, behaving uh, in this way. And given the negative externalities of vaccine refusal and the manifest public interest in epidemic control, the United States Supreme Court in 1905 ruled on a landmark case that states could pass and enforce compulsory vaccination. It's long been understood by principles of quarantine going back hundreds of thousands of years you know, that sick people are put in a different place. And it's not because we hate sick people, it's because they're exposing us to a collective risk. We'll take care of them in, in a certain uh, kind of location, for example. Sometimes it wasn't so much, but you know, the idea is that the state, the collectivity has an interest in, your free, in restricting your freedom because you're imposing risks on the rest of us. And this was adjudicated in our country repeatedly, including, as I said, in this landmark case, 100 years ago, where the state can oblige you to be vaccinated uh, for the good of everyone, not just for your own good. And as you saw in your readings, there's a geographic clustering of non-medical, non-medical exemptions, which can result in the local accumulation of a critical mass of susceptible children. So when you have groups of people that choose not to be vaccinated, if one or two out of 100 don't get vaccinated, it's not so bad because the rest of us, the, the, the germ can't take root in our population. If 99 out of 100 of us are immune, that one person who's not immune can't get the disease. You don't get an epidemic. But as the number of non-immune individuals rises, the epidemic can take root. And it's not just, doesn't just burden the people who choose not to be vaccinated or, or whose parents choose foolishly not to vaccinate them. It also affects other people in the community who have no say. For example, babies that are less than one who cannot be vaccinated, all of our babies, all of your babies, are placed at risk by the people in the community who choose not to vaccinate their kids because those one-year-olds can get measles and die from the measles because the four-year-old is choosing not to be vaccinated for medically completely foolish, unjustified uh, uh, reasons. And in fact, in the state of Washington, the county level rate of non-vaccination ranges between 1%, which is not so bad, to nearly 27%. There's some counties in Washington where 27% of the people aren't, the kids aren't vaccinated. I mean, it, it's totally nonsensical from the point of view of public health. So this shows where you live affects whether you have sensible vaccinated neighbors. Here's the exemption rate. The greener uh, counties are the ones with the highest number of exempt individuals. And here we have one of the wealthiest uh, cities in the United States that has these extraordinarily high uh, popular fraction of unvaccinated people. San Juan Island, which is a lovely, uh, have you ever been to the islands uh, in this? They're beautiful, right? Uh, you know, 13% of the people in that island aren't vaccinated, which again makes you know, no kind of public health sense. And here you have these other kind of situations here on the upper part of the state, like Ferry County, 27% of the people aren't vaccinated. Actually, different demographic here than in San Juan Island, but similar outcome in terms of non-vaccination. So this geographic clustering of vaccine refusal can result in outbreaks in the area population, including in so-called innocent bystanders, such as infants or immunocompromised individuals. And as I've already highlighted, very unusually, it's the unvaccinated children tend to be richer and whiter and tend to have a married mother with a, uh, with a college education. So unlike all the other examples we've considered, or not all, most of the other examples we've considered in this class, 
here's a kind of opposite gradation in terms of socioeconomic status and, uh, and risk uh, in the situation. An investigation by a California newspaper that was just published like a couple of weeks ago found that vaccination rates in wealthy neighborhoods of Santa Monica and Beverly Hills, raise your hands if you're from that part of the country. Yeah, so you guys probably have been hearing about this, talking to your friends and relatives. Uh, found that, uh, found that uh, vaccination rates have reduced significantly while whooping cough incidence has increased considerably. And parents in these schools are submitting what is, what used to, what is known as a so-called personal belief exemption, a PBE form. And in some schools, up to 60 to 70% of parents have filed these exemptions. They said, you know, I'm not vaccinating my kids. 60 to 70% of kids in Santa Monica uh, in these schools are not getting vaccinated because the parents just declare that they have a personal belief exemption uh, to, uh, to vaccines. And this slide uh, shows some hot spots of non-vaccination uh, in this area. Actually, this is a better image here um, that looks at the whole state of California, and it looks at uh, the anti-vaccine landscape and the fraction unvaccinated in different regions of the state with some hot spots of very large fractions of people choosing not to be vaccinated by filing the so-called personal belief exemption. And the actual number of kindergartners entering school without a full slate of vaccines is actually considerably higher than this map uh, suggests. Statewide, about 2.5% of kindergartners fall into this category in California today. But nearly 10% of California kindergartners don't start school fully vaccinated. And most of these kids are so-called conditional entrants. They're allowed to enter the school with the hope and expectation that they will soon complete their vaccination. But for whatever reasons, uh, so, and they're just behind. And it's also worth noting that the map here only shows public school kids as geographic data for private school kids isn't available. And kindergartners in private schools are more than twice as likely to have personal belief exemptions as public school kids, 5% versus 2.5%. Really, from a public health point of view, it's just been astonishing for me to watch this over the last 10 years, this unfolding ridiculous crisis in non-vaccination. It's like, we conquered these diseases. People remember, they don't remember. You know, people used to die a lot from vaccine-preventable diseases. And the vaccines do not cause autism. The, the, I think there's some Playboy Bunny or something who made this, uh, I forgot her name. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Jenny Craig? <laughs> Jenny Parkin. I mean, well, I'm not paying attention to her beliefs about, about vaccination, right? I mean, it's just this absolute sense that the woman has done more damage uh, to public health than you can, than you can imagine uh, in this regard. Many kids are dying because of this uh, false belief, which there's no way to sugarcoat it. There's no evidence whatsoever uh, that, uh, that vaccines are associated with autism. And there's some evidence that vaccines cause some harms, not autism, but the benefits swamp the harms, the benefits of being vaccinated. It's really just not a rational decision not to vaccinate your kids, unless you want to be the kind of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the parasite that says, you know, I want to be the one person that doesn't get vaccinated. Let everyone else get vaccinated and take the risk. But that's why the state intervenes and says, no, you can't make that choice. You can't make it on behalf of your children, who you're placing at risk, just like if the case we, I can't remember if we discussed this case, of the young woman in Connecticut, that, a girl that wanted to refuse treatment for cancer, and the mother was agreeing, and the state said, no, you can't make that choice. If you're an adult, you can refuse, but not, you can't, if this, your parent refuse on behalf of a child, ditto with the vaccination. And second, not only that, but unlike the cancer case, where at least you're the only one that's gonna die, here it's a communicable disease, you're putting others at risk as well, so we're gonna intervene. And as you know, or you must know, there's a very active movement, and it looks like PBEs are gonna be thrown out of California uh, in this uh, legislature, I, I hope. Uh, and here's, like, here's, the, uh, here's the growth in personal belief exemptions just in the 13 years uh, in, uh, in California. I mean, just a tremendous amount of uh, you know, it's an epidemic of people uh, refusing to get uh, vaccination. And back in 2000, only less than 1% of California kindergartners had personal belief exemptions, and by 2013, it had more than quadrupled to over uh, 3%. And in some individual school districts, the actual PBE rate is much, much higher. So, for example, at River Springs Charter School in T T uh, Temuku, I can't pronounce the name of the city in California, uh, nearly a quarter of the 556 kindergartners had personal belief um, exemptions. And it goes without saying that a measles outbreak in these communities could be devastating, and a bunch of kids would die from measles if actually a measles epidemic happened to take root in these communities. 
And these parents are gambling with the lives not only of their own children, but also of other kids in their communities as well, especially as we've, as we've already highlighted, little infants who can't get vaccine uh, protection at all. And in fact, six of the recent Disneyland cases of measles were among infants too young to be vaccinated. So that outbreak that you may have read about in Disneyland in California, it's not like the kids who got the measles were the kids whose parents chose for them not to get the vaccine. Six of those kids were infants who parents would have vaccinated them anyway, who've now been exposed to this because of other people. Am I coming on strong enough for this? <laughs> I mean, I really think this is preposterous, right? So if, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but if any of you believe that it's sensible not to be vaccinated, you can argue with me now, or you can come see me at office hours and let's talk about it in a less animated way. Um, all right. So, um, so let's look now. Let's look now at some examples of the social environment. We've talked about physical environment. We've talked about the service environment. Now let's look at the social environment of the neighborhood in which you live and how that might uh, affect your health. For example, crime and a general breakdown in the social fiber of a community have been shown to be associated with health outcomes of their residents. Here's one way to objectively assess the physical environment in order to get insight into the social environment. This is so, this known as the so-called broken windows index. Raise your hands if you've heard about the broken windows index. Yeah, so this has entered popular discourse. Literally, it's a sociological idea that's become wide, discussed in a widespread way in the last 10 years. People talk about broken windows. And what is it? Well, you go into a community and you count some things. You count the percent of the properties with major structural damage. You look at the street segments that have graffiti. You look at the street segments with accumulated garbage, and you look at the street segments with abandoned vehicles. In the old days, you used to have to walk. When I started, like 20 years ago, you used to walk through the city with notebooks and look around. Or maybe at some point, someone invented the idea of driving with a video camera and recording it. And now, you don't even have to leave your desk. You can just use Google Street View. And you can literally, if you, you want to compute the, the, uh, the broken windows index of, that would be a great uh, uh, senior thesis actually here in New Haven even, without leaving the comfort of your office, you could just drive around New Haven and, and, and quantify the extent to which these cities uh, look safe or, or not. In fact, one of my colleagues at the MIT Media Lab created a little game in which he pulled, listen how creative this was, he pulled Google Street View shots of, at random, pairs of shots from around the world, and he showed these pictures to people who volunteered to look at them, and all you had to do was rate which one was safer than the other. And he collected millions of paired ratings, and with that was able to quantify the safeness of these communities around the world by using a kind of crowdsourced algorithm coupled with Google uh, acquisition of images, a very inventive uh, idea. And these then can be combined into a single index. And nowadays, as I said, things like this can be done in a more automatic way. And it turns out that there's a link between this measure, the broken windows measure, which is seemingly a measure of the physical infrastructure, and things like the sexually transmitted disease transmission. An even net of actual poverty of the neighborhood, whether you get an STD above and beyond the poverty of the neighborhood, a net of the, uh, the attributes of yourself can depend on the broken windows index uh, of the neighborhood in which you reside. So, uh, so this slide shows the broken windows index and rates of gonorrhea per thousand in New Orleans uh, neighborhood. Um, so here we look at whether you live in a low poverty neighborhood or a high poverty neighborhood, and whether there's a low broken windows index or a high broken windows index. So the first thing to notice is, is that the low poverty neighborhood and the high poverty neighborhood actually have very similar rates of gonorrhea if it's a low broken windows index. So what it's saying here is it's not how poor the neighborhood is that's associated with whether you get a gonorrhea, you have gonorrhea in that neighborhood, it's how dysfunctional the neighborhood is that's associated, measured by this broken windows index. So this call art is the same. But second, it says that both within the low poverty neighborhood and within the high poverty neighborhood, high broken windows is a risk factor for gonorrhea, okay? So regardless of your, the wealth of the neighborhood and net of your own individual wealth, being in a neighborhood where there's this neighborhood disadvantage, this neighborhood dysfunction, quantified by this broken windows index, is associated with an increased risk of, uh, of gonorrhea. And not surprisingly, the poorer the neighborhood is, this is the worst cell to be poor neighborhood, plus high broken windows, has the highest rates of, of gonorrhea. So we'll examine uh, how neighborhoods can affect norms with respect to seemingly unrelated behaviors in just a bit. So here I'm saying to you, look, something about 
this broken windows index is associated with this other thing that's seemingly so far away, sexually transmitted diseases, how can that be? And we'll, we'll come back to that idea uh, in just a moment. And here's what a low broken windows environment looks like, even though it's poor. So this is a poor neighborhood in Chicago. I think it's Chicago, New Orleans. New Orleans. It's a poor neighborhood in, in New Orleans, but it has, it's a low broken window. Okay? It doesn't look like there's uh, something uh, uh, wrong with it, uh, or this has this feature of low broken. The, it doesn't have a high broken windows index, despite the fact that it is poor. And similarly, areas that are relatively free of crime and have a greater social cohesion are also those areas that had fewer deaths during the Chicago heat wave of 1995. So now we're going to move to another example, not broken windows and STDs. We're going to look at crime rates and how crime rates in the neighborhood where you live are associated with whether you die during a heat wave. What's the relationship between those two? How does it happen? Uh, how does the neighborhood uh, affect you? And I myself had just moved to the University of Chicago and I had finally finished my education, my MD and my PhD and my residency and everything else. And I moved with my young family to Chicago. I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old and we were in a rental house and we had just arrived in this one of the century's worst heat waves strikes uh, the city. And we, had, we were all sleeping in one room because that was, we had a tiny air conditioner in one room and we literally slept on the floor to stay cool. And we were lucky because many other residents who didn't have access to air conditioning or were in blackout or brownout conditions actually went out and slept on the street. I mean, it was so hot indoors that people were pitching tents and sleeping out in public places, even in fairly well-to-do communities around the south side of Chicago where I was living at the University of Chicago uh, at that time. And I think I may have pictures. I can't remember. Do I have pictures of No, I don't. I used to have pictures of, of uh, people in parks sleeping out on the ground. So, um, so what we're going to look at now is, is well, what, what is the association between your risk of dying in a heat wave and the, uh, uh, and the crime rate? So this looks at local crime rates and local heat wave deaths during the Chicago uh, heat wave. So these are the, uh, the darker areas are the areas with the greatest crime, and, uh, and these areas are also the areas that the, 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 I'm sorry, the dark circles indicate the regions in Chicago with the greatest crime rates, and the gray square areas indicate the regions with the greatest uh, heat wave deaths. And roughly speaking, there's a relationship uh, between those two. And in fact, there were over 700 excess deaths, 700 people died because of the heat wave uh, in, the, in Chicago uh, in that summer, but those deaths were in fact very unequally distributed across the city. This slide shows the so-called heat index, or the apparent temperature, which is a function both of the temperature and of the humidity. So for example, when I'm in Greece, uh, on those occasions where I am in Greece in the summer, uh, and it's 125 degrees, but it's dry, it's not a problem. But if you're in Thailand or in Delhi during monsoon season, even if it's only 100 degrees, it's a problem, right? Because the humidity kills you when it's combined with uh, the heat. Uh, and this slide shows the, uh, the total deaths from July 12th to 19th in 1995. So this is the number of deaths in the time period. And this shows the deaths among uh, different sorts of subjects uh, by the heat index. So this is the heat index here. The heat index peaks around July 14th. And this is total deaths in the Chicago, all three uh, categories, peaking a couple of days later, you have this excess mortality during the heat wave, which then uh, declines. And here are the causes of the deaths. Here's uh, due, to, due to the heat alone, due to cardiovascular disease alone, and due to heat and cardiovascular disease, trying to quantify a little bit of where the excess deaths come from. Basically, people dying, dying from the heat uh, or uh, from cardiovascular stress in coping uh, with the heat. And living conditions and types of social contacts made a material difference in survival uh, in this group uh, in, in, during the heat wave. And this is a study of 339 matched pair of subjects and controls that looked at the living conditions and the types of social contacts and how they were risk factors for mortality during the Chicago heat wave. So unsurprisingly, if you had access to an air-conditioned lobby, uh, the people who died, 28% of them had access to an air-conditioned lobby. I'm sorry, 10% of them had access to an air-conditioned lobby. And amongst the comparison controls, 20% of them had access to an air-conditioned lobby. So that says if you have access to an air-conditioned lobby, you are half as likely to die during the heat wave. You live in a building where if it gets really hot, you can go downstairs and sit in the lobby, it halves your risk of death, a service environment feature, okay? But now let's look at some other things. Look at participated in group activities. 
Among the people who died during the heat wave, 46% of them participated in group activities like support groups and churches, compared to 55% amongst the controls. So how might participating in group activities protect you from death in a heat wave? Ideas? Yeah, what's your name? What? Isabel? Yeah, you have access to people who can help you. Or what else? What else might your friends do for you? <coughs> yeah? Yeah, they might notice that there's something wrong with you, that they haven't seen you. They better check in on you. So social connections might protect you from death during the heat wave. Having access to transportation also is protected. How about this? People who had a pet in their home, 24% of the dead people had a pet in their home, compared to 30% of the non-dead people had a pet in their home. How could having a pet in your home protect you from death during a heat wave? Yeah, uh, Alexandra, right? Yeah. Leah, Leah. And then if you have to get out and take care of your pet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You get out of your house because you have a pet. That's exactly right, and that's what's protected. So these are risk factors. These are sort of social engagement factors that are associated with whether or not uh, you. Uh, die during the heat wave. And it's not a stretch to imagine that local neighborhoods could structure people's opportunities for such contacts, right? Local neighborhoods might have something to do with your ability to create and maintain these kinds of social connections. And in fact, sociologist Eric Kleinenberg has looked at this in depth in his rather nice book called Heat Wave. And here are some results for his comparison of two Chicago neighborhoods that had similar socioeconomic parameters, but very different outcomes in the heat wave, based on other attributes, such as the social capital and measures of civic life in these neighborhoods. So he looks at two neighborhoods that he calls North Lawndale and South Lawndale, and here's the whole of Chicago. Here's the fraction of people that are seniors living in poverty, not too different. The fraction of seniors living alone, not too different. And here's the heat wave death rate, which was 10 times higher in North Lawndale than in South Lawndale. Why is that? Why did people in North Lawndale fall like flies at 10 times the rate of the people uh, in South Lawndale was the question that Kleinenberg puts to himself. And here's a street, so North Lawndale is a bad one. Here's a street view of the North Lawndale neighborhood. This is what North Lawndale looks like. And here is what South Lawndale looks like. What's the difference? Where would you feel safer? You feel safer here? Or here? Raise your hands if you feel safer here. Raise your hands if you feel safer here. Good, that's the right answer. This is a safer neighborhood. <laughs> Why is it safer? Because there are people out and about, okay? And so Kleinenberg points to the relevance of commercial life in South Lawndale, which is actually a little village in Chicago, which pulled isolated seniors into public places and which provided seniors with safe, air-conditioned commercial venues, for example, to reduce the impact of the heat wave. And here's what some of the residents had to say. Here's Father Michael of the bad neighborhood, North Lawndale. He said, I had no fear until they told me, oh no, it's not safe. These people steal on the, uh, these people steal on the corners and so on. They would tell me that there would be drive-by shootings. They would fight among themselves, but I would be caught in the crossfire. And some feared even that if you walk, they can come and snatch you. Here's what Father Morales said in South Lawndale. Even though we have gangs, people still feel comfortable in the streets. You walk around and you see people sitting on the front steps everywhere. Here's another resident that said, we look out for each other in our neighborhood. If something is going on, we'll see it and call each other or the police. And this collective social attribute of the neighborhood made all the difference, it seems, in whether individual residents lived or died of the heat, this seemingly distant uh, outcome, seemingly unrelated, but actually truly related to the social exposures of uh, features of this neighborhood. Now, in all observational studies, whether, whether quantitative or qualitative, all kinds of problems arise when you're trying to look at neighborhood effects. How can you be sure that it's a, a contextual effect and not a compositional effect? You know, maybe there are different people live in North Lawndale and South Lawndale. Maybe that's what's causing the thing. It's not, it's not this sort of rosy story that I'm telling you or that Kleinberg is telling you or the other scientists that had those results on the, on the graphs are telling you. And there are a number of challenges when you're looking at doing neighborhood uh, research. One challenge is disentangling, as I've just highlighted, the compositional from contextual effects. And one possible solution to that is to do a multi-level statistical analysis where you take into account individual attributes 
when assessing the impact of neighborhood attributes. So you don't just stop and say, well, richer neighborhoods have fewer deaths. You say richer neighborhoods have fewer deaths, even after accounting for how rich or poor the individuals are in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Another problem is the problem of household mobility. Maybe people are moving from place to place. Maybe the people that are at risk of gonorrhea flock to the neighborhoods that have broken windows. Or maybe the people that are at risk for dying of heat waves flock to the neighborhoods like South London. So maybe it's people move from place to place, and that's what's causing the problem. And you lose track of them over the course of your study. And so for this, you need longitudinal data. You need to be able to follow individuals across time and for you see that at this moment in time, you're in a rich neighborhood, then you're in a poor neighborhood, then you're in a rich one, moment to moment or year to year, I see where you are. And another problem, of course, is the problem of endogeneity, which is what's causing what? Maybe, for instance, people who like McDonald's seek out neighborhoods where there are McDonald's present. So maybe it's not that the McDonald's are causing those people to die, it's that people who are prone to death from eating fast food move to a place where there are McDonald's. So we really can't blame the McDonald's for this. How are we going to sort out what comes first? Is it the neighborhood exposure or is it the individual outcome of some kind? And here there are a number of ways you can approach this problem. You can do experiments where we randomly assign you to different kinds of neighborhoods, like Yale randomly assigns you to JE or TD, or if you're really lucky, Silliman. Or uh, we can do other kinds of experiments, as I'll show you uh, in just a moment. Or you can use an econometric or a statistical technique known as instrumental variables, which I won't go into, but which basically means natural experiments, a kind of natural experiment instead of a, a real experiment. And in fact, the outcomes of individuals and the features of neighborhoods might be artifactually related. That is, people could choose where they live, those who don't like their neighborhood and are able to do so might move out, and sick people might move closer to amenities, for instance. So both of those things could happen. Or services could choose where to locate, and junk food outlets might move in where there's demand. So maybe it's not that McDonald's now is sort of nefariously trying to hurt people. Maybe it's that the fast food joints know that there are people there who like fast food. And that's why I'm located there. It's really not the, uh, the, the service. So we'd like to do an experiment where we randomly assign people to where they live or what kind of environment they have. And there are a number of such very difficult, very rare experiments that have been done at different scales. And I'm going to close today by showing you three or four uh, such experiments. Here's a study that was, uh, was almost a full experiment. It's a rather famous study that was published uh, uh, about 30 years ago now in science. Uh, it looked at 46 patients who underwent cholecystectomy, the removal of their gallbladder, between 1972 and 1981, during the months of May to October, at a 200-bed Pennsylvania hospital. And the patients were plausibly randomly assigned to rooms. The patients were admitted to have their gallbladder taken out, and then they were getting operated on the same hospital by the same doctors, but some patients, by dumb luck, were given rooms where um, when they looked out the window, they could see a trees, okay? The patients in these rooms, when they looked out the windows, could see trees. But the patients in these rooms, in these rooms, when they looked out the window, they saw a brick wall. So some people got to see nice, natural beauty, and other people looked at brick walls when they looked out their windows. And then the patients were grouped into 23 pairs, one member of which looked out at the trees and one member of which looked out at the bricks. And several outcomes were evaluated, including the length of stay and the amount of opioid or analgesic uh, use. And the length of stay was about one day shorter in those patients that had views of trees, about eight days instead of nine days. Really, just looking out at the trees, short people's hospital stays. And data on analgesic use for, the, for three time periods is shown here. Uh, so here we look at the comparison of analgesic doses per patient for the wall view and the tree view groups. And so here is uh, whether or not you're getting strong, moderate, or weak analgesics. And so, for example, in day zero to one, there's not a lot of difference uh, between the two in strong or weak analgesics. Now, why is that? It doesn't matter whether you're looking at a tree or a brick wall, first day post-op, what happens? Raise your hands if you've ever had surgery. Okay, did it hurt? No, not while you were having the surgery. Uh, 24 hours later. Remember when, the, when, you, when you had your wisdom teeth taken out and you go home and you like, kind of feel great right afterwards and then you say, oh, this is not a big deal. Why are everyone complaining? And then like six hours later, the morphine wears off and now you're in agony and you now understand what it was and then you put up with that agony for 24, 48 hours because most doctors don't treat pain adequately and then you begin to feel better. Huh? But if you have a big abdominal procedure, 
the initially, there are no differences between the two because they're all getting the anesthetic uh, agent. But now there's a huge difference all of a sudden. The people that are looking at the wall group require almost three times as much strong opioids as the tree group. And then when you get out to day six or seven again, there's less of a difference because by then, you, no one is having any surgical pain. So the idea here is that looking out at a tree lowers your need for opioids, right? It relieves your pain uh, in some way. Here's another true experiment, a very famous experiment that was done by a team of economists and sociologists, and a number of papers have been published over the last 20 years on this. This is the so-called moving to opportunity experiment. Between 1994 and 1997, uh, 4,248 families living in Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City were randomly assigned. We're going to take these 4,000 families, and we're going to do a huge experiment. And we're going to randomly assign them to one of three groups. One group was given a housing voucher that could be used to move to a low poverty neighborhood, and they were also given counseling on how to do that. Okay? So one group is given the golden ticket. They can get out. They can go from a poor neighborhood to a good neighborhood. The second group was given a housing voucher, and they could go anywhere they wanted. They could go to a, to a rich neighborhood or a poor neighborhood. They could go anywhere they wanted. Does anyone know why this group was there? It's a very subtle and important reason. Because maybe it's not the fact that I move you to a rich neighborhood that matters or give you a coupon that allows you to move to a rich neighborhood and then you move to a rich neighborhood. Maybe it's that sense of empowerment you feel that you have the option to move, right? The sense that I can move even if you don't move might be relevant. So the second group says it's not the fact of moving to a rich neighborhood that matters, it's the fact of moving and the having the opportunity to move that really matters. And the third group was a control group that got no new assistance, but they continued to be eligible for public housing. And in 2002, years later, one adult, 98% of whom were female from each family, were followed up by interview, and they were asked a bunch of things, their economic self-sufficiency, their mental health, their physical health, their risk behavior, uh, and their education. And moving to a richer neighborhood, or giving a coupon, giving, being given the opportunity to move to a richer neighborhood, even given a fixed level of human capital, this is an experiment now, so this is net of the individuals, had certain health effects, for example, on major depression. So uh, this looks at the percent of major depression uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the control group was higher, uh, and in the low poverty group, the group that was given the opportunity to move was lower, and it was statistically significant. So we dropped the rate of, uh, of depression when we allow people to move from a poor neighborhood uh, to a rich neighborhood. It also had an effect on obesity. So here's a low poverty neighborhood, and here's a control group, so I can't see the precise numbers, but 45% obese in the control group, and a few years later, the obesity rate is dropped by a couple of percentage points among individuals who were given the opportunity to move to a richer neighborhood. So that's the moving to opportunity experiment, and there have been dozens of papers published from it. Other experiments have randomly assigned neighborhood exposures for non health <coughs> outcomes. This is one of my favorite examples uh, that was published in Science, and this was a study in which they went in and instead of moving people, they broke windows in neighborhoods. They said, okay, we're now going to do something experimental where we manipulate the broken windows uh, uh, hypothesis. So this is an alley in Groning Groningen, Nether Netherlands, located in a shopping area and commonly used to park bicycles. And the investigators created two different conditions. The order condition, low broken windows, and the disorder condition, high broken windows. And in the disorder condition, the walls, in the order condition, the alley was clean. And the disorder condition, the alley was covered in graffiti. So they come in and spray this graffiti uh, on this thing. And notice here there's a sign that says, no graffiti. OK, that's Dutch for no graffiti. It says graffiti with a little red circle around it. But that norm is being violated. The norm graffiti, uh, the no graffiti norm is being visibly violated. So everyone parking their bicycle can see that this norm is being violated. Is everyone with me so far? Then what the investigators did is, is they attached a, with a rubber band a little flyer to the handlebar of all these bicycles. See these little flyers there and the little flyers there? And then they took away the garbage can that was in the alley. So their question was, would the people, when they got to their bike, you couldn't drive your bike unless you removed this flyer, what did you do with the flyer? Did you throw it on the ground, or did you put it in your pocket and take it like a good Dutch person uh, to throw it out in the garbage somewhere else? Everyone understand? Now, in which of those two environments do you think people are going to be more likely to throw their garbage on the ground? In the disorder condition or in the order condition? 
in the disorder condition, right? You can just turn that off if you don't mind before you leave. Hello? Just turn it off as you're going. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so in the disorder condition, what you can do is, is you can, uh, they go down and then they had a little hide, like a hunter, and they watched what people did as they came back. And they saw that people returned to the experiment, to the experimental setting, and when there was the graffiti norm was being violated, they started littering. And then they experimentally alternated. They cleaned the graffiti one day, and they put the graffiti the next day, and they saw uh, what happened. And the flyer itself just said, we wish everybody happy holidays. And it was, it was signed by the name of a non-existent sportswear shop uh, uh, in this area. And what they found was that there was cross-norm inhibition. Uh, there was a cross-norm inhibition effect of violating the anti-graffiti norm on littering was quite substantial. Of the participants in the, other con in the order condition, in which there was no graffiti, 33% littered. And in the disorder condition, 69% of the people returning to their bikes, more than double, threw the garbage on the ground. They also did another similar experiment. Here, the right-hand sign indicated that it is prohibited to lock bicycles to the fence. So here it says, you can't lock the bikes to the fence. And here, through this little gap, there's a little sign that says, you're not allowed to walk across here to get your car. You have to walk all around the block to get to the other side. It's prohibited to walk through this parking lot to get access to the parking lot where your car uh, was parked, a 200 meter uh, detour. And in the order condition, four bicycles are locked to this fence, violating the no bicycle attached rule. And then they watch do people violate the go through the uh, parking lot that's prohibited rule. And again, versus the bicycles are not locked. And they say, I love this experiment because it's done on a shoestring. It's beautifully conceived. Any one of you could come up with an experiment like this, and it's published in science. Uh, I mean, it just, you know, it's just really nicely done. Multiple experiments converging on the same uh, kind of ideas. And once again, what they found is of the participants in the order condition where bicycles were not locked to the fence, 27% stepped through the gap in the fence compared to 82%, four times as many, when they see the bicycle norm uh, being violated. So you might now begin to see this disorder and say, oh my goodness, I'll go have unprotected sex. So you can begin to see now how the broken windows gonorrhea example that we introduced at the beginning, how when you see the broken windows, it might have cross-norm effects on whether or not you have protected sex. Here now shown in this different kind of example. And finally, they did an experiment with theft, which I thought was really nifty. They examined whether an envelope, which visibly contained a five uh, euro note, which was worth about $10 back then, and hanging out of a mailbox, would be stolen more often if a contextual norm was violated. So what they did is, is they had these red mailboxes in the Netherlands, and they had this little envelope that was addressed, and they had this money that was visible, and it was partway through the slot. Uh, and then what they manipulated was, they manipulated whether there was graffiti on the mailbox, and then they hit and they watched, did people walking by the mailbox steal the money? And they found that if there was no graffiti on the mailbox, people would steal the money. But if there was no graffiti on the mailbox, they would just push the envelope in so that it could go to the intended uh, recipient. And they found that of the participants in the baseline order condition of no graffiti, 13% stole the envelope compared to 27% compared to 27% of the subjects in the graffiti disorder condition. So once again, this is an argument about how the broken windows idea might work. Any questions about this experiment? Yeah, Brooks. Yeah, uh, not about this one in particular, but the one that reads with the fireworks, where they fire the fireworks, um, which is against the law where they were doing it. I mean, can you just get permission to break the law to do a study? Like, it's usually not a good idea to ask permission to break the law. Okay, so they, they just did it, so I can publish, if I want to do heroin and see what it does. <laughs> I'm detecting a theme in your question. This is really concerning to me. We've escalated from marijuana to heroin in two weeks. Uh, I can publish that for pure scientific research. Yeah. Yes, I think there are. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there are uh, there are ways in which you can um, do things that aren't allowed. That yes, that still get published. And people, sociologists and anthropologists and economists often do these kinds of things. It was just a study that some economists got into huge trouble like a month ago that was on, I forgot what it was, it was a, a job search thing where they did, I forgot what it was, does anyone remember? It was like in the news a month ago. They did something illegal in the course of looking for uh, employment. There was also a big political science experiment uh, a few, a few about, a, about six months ago where 
they, uh, the political scientists wanted to see whether certain kinds of reminder notices would prompt people to turn out to the polls, and they used the state seal of the state they were in. It turns out that you can't use a state seal. That's like illegal. Uh, but they did. I think they didn't know uh, that it was illegal. Uh, but they nevertheless did, and they, they got into trouble for doing it. But I, I don't know if it affected the publicability of their work. So I'm not prepared to make a blanket statement about the permissibility of breaking laws because you're conducting research. Often people, when they're found looking at child pornography, for instance, say, I, I was doing research uh, when I was looking at child pornography. That's clearly not what they were doing. Uh, so you don't get a pass uh, for that. But sometimes, you know, I think if they're pretty small scale, um, then, you know, you don't get in trouble. Other questions? I mean, it's illegal to do the graffiti, too, but presumably they cleaned up the graffiti. Yeah? I have a question about, um, like, fashion. Yeah. A lot of what you've been talking about has been the media quite a bit, obviously, in the last year. And one of the things I'm wondering is, like, do you think this is a problem of individuals acting selfishly, or do you think that there's like a structural intervention that's just been missing? Like, where do you place the responsibility? Uh, in the case of the vaccine example, I would think it's both. I don't think it's either or. I think these individuals uh, have agency, which they're, you know, executing in a certain way, which is, you know, foolhardy. And I think that we have had not enough, not an effective enough public health response to this problem. Like I think that California was too permissive with personal belief exemptions, which are going to tighten that loophole now, which I think will have a nice structural response. I mean, I think it's ridiculous that Jimmy Kimmel has to get on, you know, poke fun at anti-vaxxers. Did you guys see the little thing he did? I mean, that we're, you know, we need those kinds. But I think Jimmy Kimmel and people like John Stewart and Stephen Colbert can be very effective actually in changing. So I think. I think there are opportunities for public health intervention, but I think people are, are also responsible. Yeah, I put a lot of the responsibility on. I don't think these highly educated, wealthy individuals who are choosing to believe uh, uh, Jenny uh, McCarthy uh, actually get off, get a pass. You know, I'm not, I don't believe that they have been deluded and, uh, um, you know, they're, it's just structure that's affected. Is that what you're asking? Am I answering your question? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I come on pretty strong about this because it's just, it's just the crazy stupidity, actually. It's not, it's not a lot of debate about it, uh, scientifically speaking. Okay, so just to sum up where we are today, neighborhoods can have an enduring character that affects multiple aspects of our lives and that stays constant across time. And they, and they neighborhoods, are an aspect of structure that surrounds us. Such work on health and neighborhoods faces a set of complicated conceptual and mythological challenges. One challenge I didn't go into very much today is the issue of how to define neighborhoods. Do neighborhood, uh, do neighborhood effects, for example, operate at different levels of size, and does this depend on what outcomes are considered? Is another topic we didn't discuss. So, for example, excuse me. For example, are we interested in HSAs? You know, there are only 300 in the country, or counties? There are uh, uh, 3,000 counties in the country, or zip codes. There are 25,000 zip codes or census tract, there are many of those, or block groups, or voting precincts, or blocks, or just alleyways, right? You can go all the way down from HSAs down to alleyways. And at which level of geographic aggregation do you have which effect? And of course, different levels might be relevant to different outcomes. When you think about whether your neighborhood is safe or dirty, you think about a few blocks, or whether there's a crack house next door. When you think about whether it has a hospital, you think about a broader area. You think about the city of New Haven, does it have a good hospital or not? And when you think about whether, uh, and when you think about whether the air is polluted or the laws are fairly enforced, you think about a still broader area, like maybe the state or the region in which you live. So each, each outcome and each exposure might depend in some way on the geography. But overall, we think of neighborhoods as having this kind of enduring reality that transcends the people that live within them and that has much to do with the fate that people have face uh, in their lives. So that's it for today. Have a really terrific break. And when we come back, we'll be talking for, uh, for about social networks for uh, three or four seconds.